Welcome to Positive Personal Power with hope, aspiration, and encouragement. Our goal is to build and enhance people's confidence and strength to handle life's challenges. Now, let me introduce you to your host, Nathaniel Skula. Well, today I'm joined by Mike Tobin again, and nice to see you, Mike. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I'm also joined by Ed Vasey, who's a former UK government tech and culture minister uh, from 2010 and uh, to 2016. And yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very interested to, uh, to talk to you, actually. And um, yeah, welcome, Ed. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, I've got a few questions here, Mike. But if you wanna, if you well, want no, to, I was just saying, I was just saying to Ed just before we went live there that um, you, you you were doing a few podcasts of your own, weren't you? I think you did the um, the lockdown culture podcast. Is that is that one? Yeah, did? I've started a podcast called uh, Lockdown Culture, which I do with a woman called Charlotte Metcalf. We do it for a posh magazine called Country and Townhouse, and uh, obviously because of uh, COVID, they've had to go digital very fast. And they thought a podcast would help them uh, keep their audience. It's been very enjoyable, actually, because the great excuse about a podcast is you can ring up anyone that uh, is doing anything interesting and say, can we have a 10 minute chat about it? And people are always happy to do it. And uh, it's a good way of kind of getting behind uh, the news and also a good way, weirdly, of sort of catching up with acquaintances and contacts in a way that's neither a kind of business meeting where you're sort of trying to churn through something, nor is it a kind of slightly inconsequential social chat. It's got a bit of a purpose, but it's also quite friendly. So I quite enjoy doing it. So, I, you know, we talked to someone like Stuart Murphy, who runs the English National Opera, or Nick Kenyon, who runs the Barbican, or the woman who runs the Hastings Modern Art Gallery in Hastings. And they've been great. It's pretty cool. So I find I'm, I'm talking a lot more on, on Zoom than I, than I do on the, on the phone, because... I always feel it's a little bit sort of aggressive just to randomly phone someone up and expect them to answer the phone. And a lot of people you know, won't answer the phone because they may be in, in, engaged in something else. But these kind of these online, these sort of sort of scheduled things are quite good because it's like having a meeting, you know, making an appointment with someone that it's easier to do because no one has to go anywhere. But it's kind of in the diary and you're, you're prepared for it and you allocate the time. I think it's really it's a lot better than a phone call. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think scheduling a call is a, is a good thing and as zoom has become the sort of uh, definition of lockdown i mean obviously if i get a call and it says mike tobin on my phone i don't answer it uh so obviously you, you forced me to schedule this appointment but um generally speaking yeah you do but you, you've got to again i think you've got to you know the thing about meeting people physically is you, you tend to travel to different destinations which gives you a chance to to reset. So I think it's sensible in your diary to keep a space between your Zoom calls. It's very easy to think, well, I'm going to be at my desk. I don't commute. So I'll schedule a nine o'clock, a 9.30, a 10 o'clock, a 10.30. I think that's crazy. I think you've got to schedule a 10 o'clock, an 11 o'clock, a 12 o'clock, because otherwise you do get overwhelmed. It has its own, as we know, there's this new concept of Zoom fatigue. So it is, I think, more tiring, weirdly, to talk to somebody on a video than it is if you're in a coffee shop because you can look around, you can do whatever. Uh, but it's definitely a good way of keeping in touch. I mean, I often get Zoom calls where I don't turn on the video because I'm multitasking. So uh, the dog is frantically asking me to throw a ball or something like that. So I can do the call. We're on Zoom. I can turn the video on when I want to make a particular point where I'm engaging with someone. Uh, but otherwise, I turn the video off. Always good to remember to mute when you're not the person talking as well, because <laughs> there can always be noises off. Uh, but I definitely think, I mean, you know, we're all debating about what's going to happen when we go back to normal in inverted commas. And I certainly think, I mean, I split my time between Oxfordshire and London. But when I'm in London, I would often go into town for two or three meetings. Now I think I'd look at my diary and say, well, I'm not going to go into town for that. I'll do those three meetings on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, and I'll also, without wishing to sound arrogant or unpleasant, to a certain extent, you'll grade the meetings. So if it's just someone you just need to quickly check in with, you'll do it on Zoom. But if it's someone you want to meet because you think there's going to be a kind of business relationship coming out of it that's important to you, 
you probably want to meet them face to face. So you'll grade a bit of that. But I think what, what is a very long way of saying, I think what COVID has done is it's, it's made the video conference and the video call completely acceptable. I mean, we've all had FaceTime for years and we don't, we've never really thought about using it for meetings before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now it's made it totally acceptable to say to someone, yeah, let's do this on Zoom. Yeah, it's a real mainstream now, isn't it? And and, and so what else have you been keeping busy yeah. with? So when, when did you, when did you, um, can we say it sort of retire from, from, uh, from, from the house? <clears throat> so I stood down from parliament uh, at the December elections. So uh, obviously there was the election campaign itself where I helped a few friends and <laughs> then into Christmas and then sort of January, I was getting ready for my new life. I have, uh, five or six different clients that I work with mainly in the telecoms and tech space uh, giving them advice uh, looking for new opportunities for them uh, but I had hoped to um, go back into government in a sort of loose sense of the word so <clears throat> one of the reasons I left parliament was there was the old kind of quango job kept coming up and I thought that's a job I'd love to do but I can't because I'm an MP so I thought maybe I could get uh, a job <clears throat> working with a quango. I mean, not necessarily a full-time job, but one that, because I'm very interested in the nexus between business and public policy. So the chairmanship of Tech Nation, which is the quango that um, looks after the kind of tech startup community came up and I applied for that. And they sent me a very nice email saying, uh, actually, you're definitely not someone we want and we're not even going to bother interviewing you. So despite being the minister who helped set up Tech Nation. So I slightly had to reevaluate my career plans. <laughs> well, don't and, worry uh, about it, Ed. I, I was refused for that one as maybe well. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. We should have coordinated. We should have offered to do a job share. We might have at least got an interview. 50-50, yeah. It uh, was a package. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, so clearly, I'm not going to be running a quango anytime soon. Um, so uh, I don't. I missed Parliament a bit. There's definitely, um, uh, you know, as an MP, you have an automatic platform, and to yeah. get stuck into some of these debates about how the government's handled COVID or Cummings or even the current stuff about Black Lives Matters, because I got very involved in diversity when I was a minister. Right. Uh, I would be tempted, but. Um, I certainly don't miss the inbox. I mean, I can't imagine what my successor's inbox is like in terms of uh, the amount of people who quite genuinely obviously get in touch with their MP because their business is about to go under or one of their relatives is sick and not getting treatment. Uh, it must be pretty overwhelming if you're an MP at the moment. And I guess even on the culture side, right? I mean, you know, you, you were, you were responsible for culture and that's a very broad term, but, but you think about the kind of stuff that's going on. You mentioned Black Lives Matter, which is obviously, a, you know, very very topical right now but it's also you know some of the stuff that's you know that's happening in terms of pulling down um statues and you know th there's a real you know again your inbox would have been kind of red hot with that stuff as well right yeah well i mean obviously culture itself is suffering because uh nobody can go to the theater or a concert so that would have been that had kind of <clears throat> meetings with a lot of my old contacts from the cultural world about how they're going to get out of that. But then you've got effectively these kind of culture wars. And, you know, if you cover culture in, in public policy terms, that includes obviously the, the huge sensitivity around, you know, what theatre shows and so on. And I got very involved in those diversity debates when I was a minister because, frankly, very little has been done to open up opportunities for black and minority ethnic uh, people to have their stories heard so that's a massive issue yeah. and then there's a the whole heritage issue you know the Colston statue how do you deal with what is a very very complex issue of someone who in his time clearly what he did was in inverted commas normal obviously totally unacceptable yeah. on any moral reading but at the time society accepted it as normal uh, but who gave a lot back to the city he came from in Bristol and I think people are right that they should, I think that statue should be taken down. I think it's a terrible kind of uh, reminder to the community in Bristol of somebody who made his money uh, off the back of the suffering of their ancestors. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's also right that it's fished out of the harbour and put in the museum. 
yeah. in the same way you would have a Roman emperor who uh, pillaged away in a museum and explain who they were and the context of their time. So, but I definitely think that, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of part of a bigger debate as well. I'm going to, terrible stream of consciousness here, but not only do you have the cultural debate, you know, are these people appropriate to be honoured still? But also I think I, I, I'm passionately in favour of Britain being a modern forward looking country. I hate the kind of nostalgia we live with in this country. Mm. I think part of that is because all of our cities are full of these Victorian statues. It's a bygone age and uh, we need to move on from that. Yeah, I mean, so, well, I mean, if you look at Parliament Square, you've got, um, you know, you've got a kind of a selection, an interesting selection. And I suppose Trafalgar Square is also similar. You've got the, the fourth pillar that's allowed to kind of refresh every, what is it, six months or so. And so there is some form of kind of using um, public art, if you can describe, you know, sort of statues as, as public art. It, it, there, there is some sort of endeavor to make that, uh, you know, more modern and, and more current, I guess. Totally right. And I think the fourth plinth is a classic example. So not only, so the fourth plinth idea came out by accident because funny enough, guess what? When they were debating what statue to put on the fourth plinth, no one could agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just shows how, you know, even let alone which statue to take down, the debate about what statue to put up is a nightmare. <laughs> so massively full of kind of cultural conflict and, and debates, hugely political. Yeah. So that's one bit. But also I think the fourth plinth has been a fantastic success. It's, uh, it showcases great contemporary art. It's always slightly quirky and controversial. It's always engaging. People really love it. It's a brilliant idea. And uh, I think, funny enough, you know, on the back of that, Mike, I think that, you know, maybe we should kind of stop worrying about the concept of a statue and think about, you know, contemporary art and so on, having a, or even old art having a much more prominent place in public spaces. I mean, one of the things that frustrates me about museum, I mean, we're really going down rabbit holes here, but <laughs> you know, museums are housed in very, very forbidding Victorian buildings, which a lot of people who don't come from a kind of background where going, going to a museum is kind of the normal thing you do with your parents or whatever, find pretty off putting. Whereas if you take some amazing painting and stick it in a glass cube in the middle of Trafalgar Square, a lot more people would come up and look at it and think, well, you know, that's quite interesting. You're more likely to get people saying, well, I might go and uh, you know, look up that painter or whatever or find out a bit more about it when I get home. So we should rethink how we use public spaces. We're stuck with this kind of ancient tradition of putting up statues to heroes. And it's uh, long overdue to, yeah. for a revision. I agree with that. Absolutely. And, and, and I guess the other thing... Um... I just noticed while you were talking, we're, we're wearing um, almost a similar blend of colours on this uh, in this group, aren't we? We're all kind of bluey, bluey, purpley sort Blue. of. Color. I don't know. We, there was no negotiation on that, right? There was just it just randomly that we came out in large. Random. Yeah. Um, but 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 it's not that we're all Chelsea supporters or anything, is it? Just saying. Well, I am actually. All <laughs> right, I'd say. <laughs> Um, but, this, but the last time we met, I think, was was at a sporting event of some sort. I can't remember what it was now. But 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 um, I just read today in your in your you've got a great um, piece that comes out um, online every Friday, which is your Vasey views. And and one of the articles in it today was about the concept of putting um, fake um, chanting over the over the over the football. What's your what's your view yeah. on? That? I think it's a great idea. Again, it's, it's an interesting one in the terms of the intersection between tech and uh, uh, mainstream activity, if you like, that um, apparently one of the things they're thinking of is that you could all be in the pub, slightly defeat the purpose of having these um, games behind <laughs> closed doors, by the way, and you could have a live stream, you could have a live stream into the stadium so that the people watching the match on the television when they cheer a goal or groan at the referee, that gets piped straight into the stadium in real time <clears throat> to recreate the atmosphere. But I don't see anything wrong with having uh, taped audience noises, a bit like those terrible 70s comedies we all grew up on of and canned that. laughter. I think yeah. it's good. I mean, it must be, I mean, I'm obviously not a sportsman or a professional footballer, but it must be weird playing a game 
in a completely empty and silent stadium. And to have some kind of crowd noise, I think is definitely a good idea. And even better if you can get technology that allows fans at home to be cheering and screaming and to have their voices piped into the stadium would be amazing. But that's the kind of thing definitely. tech's potentially capable of doing now. And I guess yeah, if you're watching it on TV, right? I know the BBC is going to going to air some film, some pro, some uh, matches and stuff. But I guess I get it makes it more enjoyable watching it on TV as well, doesn't it? If you've got some sort of background cheering. I mean, if if you ever play FIFA, yeah, I haven't watched. I, you play FIFA like that, yeah, and they, I haven't watched they put the cheering on, don't they? Of course, of course. exactly. And I haven't I haven't watched the Bundesliga games, so I don't know what it's like to watch them without any crowd noise. I mean, I can imagine. To a certain extent, watch it on television. You don't worry so much about the crowd noise because you're, you know, you're watching the game. You've got a great seat, and you've got commentary. Uh, but I, it must affect. It must affect the way the players play. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, not to have a crowd there. Definitely, definitely. So, so you know, I was going to say, um, now we're all on technology at the moment, right? So, so have you, have you sort of. Have you found that uh, tech is is changed your world? You must have done. Me? Yeah. Oh yeah. I wanted to ask Ed about what he thinks about people's digital skills uh, to match the future needs uh, of the future of work. Really. Um, I mean, I've 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 sort of learned in the last ten years how to really use uh, computers and all this sort of stuff, but. I mean, it's it's a really tough time for people right now. And they've sort of been forced, haven't they? A lot of people have been forced to either stay at home and not have any skills or just, you know, carried on as business as usual because they're used to working from home. But I think it's it's a big, big struggle for a lot of people right now. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're all, as it were, white collar workers. So to a certain extent, this world is designed for us because a lot of it is about ideas and uh, strategic thinking and that kind of thing. Uh, we don't sit and make things. So provided we can do Zoom calls and handle emails and so on, uh, we're all right. And then the generation coming up behind us or two generations behind, you know, that I work with seem to have <clears throat> almost innately the digital skills needed to uh, do presentations or uh, use all the software and analytical tools they need for their jobs. And I think that comes, uh, that sort of comes innately when you're, when you're working, uh, when you're starting uh, work, it probably starts at kind of university. Um, you know, my kids are 12 and 13 and they're on their phones all the time and they're probably innately picking up skills that will be useful for them when they're entering the workforce in eight or nine years time. Uh, so I think that work will change in that sense that people like us to a certain extent will, will work from home much more than we used to. <coughs> the challenge is obviously that the future of the economy is, is, is going to be driven by kind of knowledge businesses and high tech businesses. And what is going to be the role of people who may not have those skills? And I think, uh, to a certain extent, technology can change that, can help with that. Because I think um, one of the things I feel quite strongly about, and one of the things I think the pandemic has changed, is this idea that, again, a sort of Victorian idea that education is, you know, you start at school at five, you finish at 18, you go to university or college, and that's it, you've done it. And I think many more businesses are going to, um, go uh, are going to effectively become skill hubs for their workers i was talking to a guy yesterday who started um he started a business called code code academy it's based in new york but backed by some uk venture funders and uh, he was making this very obvious point which i had completely missed which is uh, you know he 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 was a humanities graduate he started in the world of tech he decided he wanted to learn a bit about coding so he knew what the tech guys were talking about. He found there was no suitable uh, way that he could learn those skills. So he basically set up a company to teach people like him how to code. So it's online, obviously. But of course, what's happened on the back of Code Academy is 
he grew, he grew one way, which is individuals saying, I'm going to sign up and learn how to code. But suddenly companies come to him and say, right, we want to provide this online course for the people who work in our firms. So I think more and more, we're getting used to the idea that people will move jobs much more frequently. We're getting used to the idea, particularly with millennials, that they'll go to companies and say, I'm not working for you unless I can see how ethical and transparent you are or how green you are. And I think more and more will say to them, I'm not working for you unless you can give me skills, additional skills, not necessarily directly related to the job I'm doing now, that are going to equip me to move on with my career. So I think businesses and companies working with tech firms are going to provide much more kind of bite size, if you like, learning to give people the skills they need. Because this economy, all economies are changing so rapidly. Yeah, it's, it's the rate very, of very change. difficult to keep up. I think it's the rate of change, of change, if you like. So it's, it's sort of, you know, where, where our minds, you know, so technology can move very quickly and evolve very quickly, but our minds can't t- typically evolve as fast. So, you know, we, we tend yeah. to have to kind of lag the, whereas historically, you know, we came up with ideas and we had to wait or invent the technology to, 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 to exploit that opportunity. I think nowadays there's more technology out there than we can create the imagination. We have the imagination to, to use. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the challenges now is that, is that, you know, probably technology isn't the barrier anymore. I mean, if you look at, um, and again, something you mentioned um, in your thing today is it's f- uh, facial recognition. You know, that the, the power of facial recognition is immense, right? Yet we, we, our ability to absorb, to accept that as not being a sort of a, a big brother type, um, you know, tool is, is, is way sort of um, behind in, in, it, in its evolutionary cycle, I think. That's very good. Very good point. The whole debate about tech regulation is very interesting. So, uh, you know, I don't have a, again, I mean, it's just it, a lot of the problems with tech are the problems that we've had for, you know, years and years and years in terms of, the concerns they create. So why are we suddenly worried about te- uh, facial recognition when we weren't really worried about CCTV cameras? Well, obviously facial recognition is a step up and the ability for the invasion of privacy and the monitoring of uh, people, particularly from repressive uh, regimes is massive. Uh, but at the same time, as you say, Mike, there's a lot of good that can come from facial recognition, not just from fighting crime, but looking for missing people, for example. So I think rather than kind of some of these tech companies doing the big I am and saying we're not going to allow our facial recognition technology to be used by the police, uh, there needs to be a debate between policymakers and the tech companies because clearly there are these biases in facial recognition based on their algorithms and so on that need to be sorted out. Uh, and clearly there needs to be reg- regulation about where and how you can use facial recognition. But to say that this uh, technology is off the table is, is, in my view, wrong. It's wrong, yeah. Uh, but it's like everything, you know. Every time when I was a tech minister, I said we should regulate tech in some way because I don't want eight-year-old kids accessing porn, for example, or I don't think women should be threatened with rape on Twitter. Uh, yeah. I was accused of being the sort of censor and not understanding tech. Clearly, we need regulation. Everything is regulated, and it's regulated for a reason. It's regulated to keep us safe. You can have too much regulation, uh, and you can have too little regulation, and it's hard to get the balance right. But the idea that you should have no regulation for something as all-pervasive as technology is ludicrous. Yeah, I agree completely. I've just been, uh, I've just been, uh, just did a podcast interview a couple of days ago with. Um, uh, let me see, ex uh, DOD cybersecurity deputy chief in in America, and a uh, very experienced uh, chief information security officer here, data protection officer, and it's absolutely ridiculous. I've been trying to lock down my eight year old daughter's uh, te- uh, tech from remotely because she lives with her mother, right? And it's it's a minefield, and 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 her friends' parents uh, and her friends think that it's completely ridiculous that. I'm using something to monitor her online, right? And control what she can and cannot do. And it's just like, well, you're idiots, guys. Sorry, mm. but if you're, not, if you're not protecting your children and what they're doing, 
and educating them along the way so then you can take off the training the training blinkers if you like then you really don't know what you're doing yeah <laughs> sorry but that's my opinion on yeah, exactly. that one. well i think the interesting yeah, exactly. the, the interesting thing i think being in the uk versus some other markets I, I read i read somewhere that um in the first quarter this year despite everything that's going on the uk's received like five billion of investment into tech Right, and that's more than all of the rest of Europe put together. Yeah. I and think that, that might have been a Tech Nation report, Mike. Or was it? <laughs> well, I, I would have probably exaggerated that. Just the, 10, Ten billion, if I was, if I was. Sure. You, you and I, you and I could have been jointly, you and I could have been jointly launching it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's interesting. I mean, you know, what, you know, why, why is it then that 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 the UK is attracting that kind of investment in in technology when? You know, versus, ver, you know, obviously, you know, the US is, a, is another story, but versus all of the rest of Europe, right? Europe That's Europe. part of my next part of my next question, actually. Um, so, you know, Mike and I and you, obviously, we've we've all got a special interest in, in information technology and we, we know that there's a skills gap. Everyone knows there's a skills gap and lots of work's being done in eastern europe poland ukraine uh india indonesia what do you think we should be doing about that uh, ed on the skills gap yeah i think uh i don't know i i get uh i get slightly um I don't get as worked up about the skills gap as, as, as other people do, partly because I think every country in the world has it. You know, when I was a minister, we talked constantly about the skills gap and how many new tech jobs uh, we were going to need to fill. But then, of course, you, the minute you went to the US, which is meant to obviously be the home of tech, you found they were discussing exactly the same issue. So every country is struggling with it. To a certain extent, it will sort itself out because people who are you know, the landscape changes, you know, when you're a kid thinking about what to do with your career in the 1980s, you might have thought about finance or you might have thought about law. Now, if you're a kid thinking about what to do with your career, you may well be thinking tech or being an entrepreneur, you know, the whole kind of culture has changed. Yeah. And to a certain extent, you pick up the skills, you know, think about all the games developers our age in their sort of 40s and 50s who all say, oh, well, the thing was that I started uh, coding on a BBC acorn. Uh, and so I think you'll find a lot of people going into the workforce in their 20s who have picked up a lot of the skills because they have a passion and an interest in the, in the sector they've ended up in. So that's one thing. <clears throat> the second thing kind of echoes what I said about Code Academy, which is that um, I think there has to be a radical rethink in education we have to stop thinking about the these fixed institutions and this fixed time frame that you do your education we have to think about it being much more flexible you have to think about business being part of it one of the things i think is very obvious is that particularly if we're looking at it and stuff simply learning in, in an abstract way is ridiculous because you need access to the latest technology because it will be yeah, different you, in a year's time so if you don't have the big businesses they need to be part of the uh, equation. So it needs to be a mix of that. Um, you can't, one thing I don't think you can do is kind of predict. You can't say, I need 50,000 more people with artificial intelligence qualifications by the year 2022, because no, you have no idea how this marketplace will develop. You do need to shake up things like computer science teaching in schools. And that's something that my friend Ian Livingston is very passionate about. It should be mandatory now in schools that kids do at least learn the rudiments of coding, if only to just understand the back end of everything that's going to run their lives. Yeah, yeah. That, that's absolutely true. And I, and I think if you, you know, I, I left school at 16, did an apprenticeship in electronics engineering. I think there should be kind of computer oriented apprenticeships for people that aren't necessarily um, as academically um, sort of biased, but still want to do well and have lots and lots of skills capabilities right and and that goes into the kind of the real world stuff as well right so you go into a company as a as a as a young person kind of not fully cooked yet but you're you're then learning that that last bit on the job and you're saying okay how do these skills how, how do i how do i apply my a my interest and be my potential skills into real world situations and 
you know, and then not worry about the fact that your career might take six or seven different paths before you settle in one. But I, but I guess, you know, there's one part, which is the, 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 the new generations coming through, and that's an educational story in itself. But that's, that's it. I'm with you. I'm, I'm less concerned about that. But I do think that there's still to come more seismic shifts in, in, the, in the employment base of, on the planet than we've seen before. And if you look in the U.S., the, the, the number one job, if you like, in, in the U.S. Is, is driving of some sort, right? So you've got truck drivers, taxi drivers, bus drivers. And, and, and you know, if you think how close we are now, and we don't know, I don't know whether it's like three years, five years, ten years, but whatever it is, we are going to be in an autonomous vehicle environment at some point, right? And all of those people will have will have no job other than they need to reskill, retrain, and they're in a more they're from a more um, let's say traditional background that probably doesn't lend itself to that flexibility that today's kids coming out of school probably live with. So, so I think that's going to be a real challenge: is is that entire swathe of the community reskilling them when when things like you know fundamental shifts in our in our in our in our world like autonomous vehicles that when when they come through yeah i mean you've already got delivery delivery little delivery cars in, uh, and, in yeah. milton Keynes. they're delivering people's groceries in these things yeah. already i mean it's you know it's not going to be lot drone deliveries all these sorts of things yeah I've just been, I've been giving a lot of thought to the future of work and these sorts of things. And so many, so many chief digital officers and, and chief data officers uh, have been promoted to CEOs. It's, it's crazy the past few months. Um, it's just, you know, digital is just seems to be, I mean, if you think we've been forced from uh, to complete uh, two years worth of digital transformation in essence, in, in two months with no planning, um, uh, yeah. beforehand, uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing what, what, what the NHS has done and, and what we've, we've actually all done really, uh, it, it could have been so much worse <laughs> really, you know, in that respect anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, in, it's interesting kind of the dogs that haven't barked, you know, I mean, although my internet <laughs> connection in Oxfordshire is quite patchy, it's held up with four people, you know, pretty much online most of the day and night. Uh, and I think things like, for example, uh, the furlough scheme and universal credit, people applying online, it seems to have gone very smoothly. So there's been lots of stuff that's worked well. But just back on the future of work, I mean, one of the stats that in impressed me the most was a conversation I had with BT, you know, where they moved 8,000 call center workers to work from home. And the interesting thing about that transformation was, was, were two things. One was obviously they had to physically get them the kit to work from home and make sure it was all connected and worked properly. But the other thing is regulation. So if I'm uh, sitting at home at my dining room table uh, doing a, as a BT call center person, the last thing I want is my wife wandering in, looking over my shoulder and seeing, you know, Mike Tobin's phone bill in front of her <laughs> eyes. Um, because it's, uh, you know, it's an invasion of Mike's privacy, much as we'd all like to do that. Um, <laughs> and that's why, the, that's why the regulations are drawn in a way that discourage call centre workers from working from home. But that obviously needs to change and they need to put in measures that, that make sure that can't happen. Uh, but suddenly it sort of goes back to Mike's point about, you know, people being put out of work because autonomous driving might come about, which, by the way, I don't think will happen anytime soon, completely autonomous. But at the same time, that move of BTs opens up huge new job opportunities for people, uh, you know, disabled people, whatever, people who might find it hard to get to a physical space or people who want to say, I'd love to do a bit of call center work, but I just want to do three hours, nine till 12. Yeah. Uh, and they can do, do it from home. All of these jobs, of course, are under threat because the call center worker in three years time just might be a chatbot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The... The uh, delivery driver might be an autonomous vehicle, but I think one of the great virtues of capitalism and an open market economy is that new jobs spring up so easily and new ways of doing things. The challenge which brings together the future of work and Nat's concern about skills is are those jobs going to be highly, more and more requiring high skills in order to um, in order to be filled or are they going to be are they going to be the opportunity for people with 
less fewer skills to move from say being the job of a delivery driver to something else in this new economy yeah 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 i've been giving a lot of thought to this and talking to talking to all sorts of uh, of techie people and ethics within ai and all these sorts of conversations you know and it's the whole thing is uh, it, it, like it's actually if linkedin turned around and said well actually we're going to pioneer a solution for this they could they could crunch the data people could join up to linkedin and they could turn around and say well actually uh, Mr. Bloggs, you, you need to fill out a questionnaire. Okay, I'm going to answer 10 questions. All right. So now I've just told you that I like these 10 different things. And I can now plug that data into LinkedIn and say, well, okay, now you, we think you need to learn about this, 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 and this. Here are the courses. Within three years, we predict that this, in fact, is going to happen to your job. And if you do this, 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 and this, you're going to potentially get a better paying job doing something you enjoy more. And it's like, well, actually, that is a no brainer to create that with the data that they have, but they don't want to do it because they want to sell subscriptions to recruiters who, in essence, we don't really need anyway, <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> That's an interesting concept. Um, we're, we're probably running short on time now, but I, I, I'll, I'll give you one to round it back off to, uh, to politics again, Ed. Um, we, we saw yesterday, I think it was, that Twitter is, is um, coming. Uh, Twitter's, you know, because politics, you know, Trump is a great tweeter. Um, but, but, but <laughs> well, I don't know whether his tweets are great, but he's a prolific tweeter, let's put it that way. Um, but, 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 Twitter in their wisdom have come up with a great piece of advice that says you should read the tweet before you resend it, before you reshare it. Yeah. What's your thought on that? What does that say about people that use Twitter generally? What are you saying about me, Mike? It's not to be rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Twitter is extraordinary. I mean, what I find interesting about Twitter in my own little Twitter world of, you know, who I follow is, it's almost like it is, it is a microcosm of real life because we all know people who, when you're at a party or an event, they just won't shut up and they kind of dominate the conversation. Now, I feel that on Twitter because I, you know, I follow a few, obviously, very well-known people, whether it's Donald Trump or Piers Morgan or whatever, but I tend to also follow <coughs> people I know, MPs and journalists. And I'm just... I'm always staggered, first of all, about how often people post. I mean, I can see posts from people, they are posting literally a new tweet every hour. Yeah. Secondly, that they genuinely want to share their fatuous opinion with all their Twitter followers. I mean, it is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and thirdly, that they feel, I suppose it's related to second one, they, they feel this kind of great sense of, I mean, they must have uber confidence in chutzpah. That, <laughs> What they're saying is of any interest to anyone in the world. And it just <laughs> fucking staggers me, frankly. Oh, I'm going to have to put an R rating I mean, on this now, Ed. Yeah. I can't believe it. Another one of Mike's guests has made me push that R rating now. Second one now. I can't believe it. I think you're lucky you got away. I my think you great, picked out the others. Funny, my, great, my, great, my great weakness on Twitter is I do retweet. I'm too lazy to do my own tweet, so I tend to retweet. <laughs> And so basically when I go on Twitter, say every three hours I go on Twitter, inevitably in the first 10 tweets, I see, I see three interesting things. So I just retweet them. Yeah. So God knows what it's like if you follow me. But I do, I do always, because I was in public life, I do always check the tweet. The last thing you want to do as a politician, as we have seen on countless occasions, is to retweet someone, you know, who turns out to be a virulent anti-Semite. You know, you want to yeah. slightly check <laughs> yeah. who the hell you are retweeting. That's true. Um, so it is, it's good advice, long overdue. It's very serious. So, so I know Mike wants to get off because he's got another interview that I can see him. He's, he's going, come on, hurry up. <laughs> but I want to who's ask he, you, Who's he got? I don't know. I, 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 I can't say. I can't he say. Can't, oh, look, he can't <laughs> say. <laughs> so I've got one I'm question. Sorry, I'm sorry to keep President Obama waiting. <laughs> <laughs> So, Ed, what are your thoughts on how the public are viewing the mainstream media and how it affects their lives and mentality, especially in these times of, uh, of lockdown? 
you know, I think the public's always had a love-hate relationship with the media, and I think the public's much more savvy about the media than politicians and others let on. Mm. You know, people who buy the sun take the sun with a pinch of salt. Uh, people who read the Times take the Times or the Telegraph with a pinch of salt. They know their agenda. To a certain extent, I think, uh, you know, what has happened with mainstream media, to a certain extent, is people have got more and more in their tribes, and the newspapers have perhaps become a little bit more polemical. Um, someone yeah. like me could comfortably read The Guardian 10 years ago now I might think mm, it's a bit too kind of of the left um, <laughs> so but I think you know I think the public to a certain extent I think they regard the media as their sort of slightly unruly cousin they know that the media hypes stuff up uh, but they find it entertaining and interesting and they like to get hyped up themselves a bit I also think we underestimate how much well, we know people, a lot of people get most of their news from the BBC and thank God the BBC has a lot of faults and problems, but fundamentally, at least, it is independent, relatively apolitical and tends to give you the news relatively straightforwardly. Yeah. So long may that happen. We haven't yet got to the point where people have turned off the main broadcasters and are simply getting all their news from dodgy Facebook sites. Yeah, it's a bit like a sort of an echo chamber, isn't it? Going, going you, know, you surround yourself with people that, that kind of are like minded. Oh, yeah, exactly. You're going to get the same message that you already think, already have. So you never really stretch, yeah. you know, stretch your concept sort of thing. Never test your own theories. Brilliant. Well, look, we'll let Mike go off to his conference call with Barack. <laughs> And, it's been um, brilliant having you, Ed, and I um, look forward to seeing you in person and uh, as soon as we possibly can, because I, I, I'm literally the temptation now to kind of, you know, just get out there and get try and get back to normal is is is, is growing by the hour. I think. Oh yeah, I think I think we can't put up with more than a couple more weeks of this. No, and I think this, you know, the two meters got to be one instantly and got to go away completely within, you know, I was on the phone to a friend of mine in Germany just this morning and he's sitting there and he's got, he said, we've been out of lockdown for, for ages, things are normal, you know, we're rocking around, you know, he's got kids, he, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it feels like it's now being a little bit of a different world for us than, than elsewhere. <laughs> it's just, you know, we oh, should totally, really... Totally. So, um, so look, I mean, uh, everyone tries to do their best and, and I'm sure government is, is, is doing everything they, th they you know, no one goes in the, in, into the office in the morning saying, oh, well, let's, let's see how much we can screw up today. You know, it's not house of cards, you know? And so, so it's kind of, they're, they're trying to do what they, what they want to do best. But, um, but I think now we're, we probably need to get cracking and get on with life. Yeah. Which, yeah. which is a great segue into Thanks, getting on with Thank you so much, Ed. Oh, See you later. Um, Nat, where can where can we find um, where can we find your podcast? And Ed, where can someone find you if they want to um, put you on the, as chairman of the uh, new new Quango of the year? <laughs> You've got a website, uh, Ed, haven't you? Yeah, Vasey dot com, I think it is. <laughs> edvasey.com yeah, yeah i think i had a look at it earlier i had a little browse and uh yeah i'm sure people can get you there and brilliant thanks, thanks, guys. thanks mate thanks Mike. Thank you. Later, guys cheers thanks for listening to positive personal power do subscribe via your favorite podcasting app and please leave us a five-star review. Or sign up on our website, positivepersonalpower.net for weekly emails and updates and do share our episodes with your friends and on social media. Feel free to reach out anytime.